towards the end of the Hajj, which the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, performed with tens of thousands of companions in the last year of his life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declared that the religion had been perfected, that he had completed his blessings, and that Islam was the only valid religion in the sight of Allah. Thus, it was made clear that the religion of Islam was complete and perfect in everything and that there was no need to add or subtract anything from it. In his hadiths, the Messenger of Allah clearly stated that prophets ruled the nations before him and when a prophet passed away, another prophet came in his place but there would be no prophet after him and that caliphs would rule his ummah after him. However, he did not give any explicit orders as to who the caliph would be after him. The calendars showed the year 632. On the 27th day of the month of Sefer, the Messenger of Allah peace be upon him began to have a headache. After a few days, the disease progressed. The companions were very upset. Upon hearing this, the Messenger of Allah addressed his companions as follows. O oh my companions, you are worried about my death. Has any prophet ever stayed forever among his ummah, so that I may stay forever among you? Know that I will meet my Lord. The prophet's illness was progressing. Normally, the Messenger of Allah would lead all the prayers. However, three days before his death, his illness became more severe. Since he could no longer go to the masjid, he asked Hazrat Abu Bakr to lead the prayers. Hazrat Abu Bakr led the companions in 17 prayers, while the Prophet peace be upon him was ill. This was interpreted by the companions as a sign that Abu Bakr radiallahu an would be the caliph after the Prophet. The blessed soul of the Messenger of Allah ascended to Rafiq Ala on Monday, which corresponds to the 12th of the month of Rabiul Awwal. When the news of the Messenger of Allah's death was heard among the companions, the companions began to burn with the pain of separation. Hazrat Ali did not know what to do out of astonishment. Hazrat Umar took his sword in his hand and cried out that he would strike the neck of anyone who said that the Messenger of Allah was dead. Hazrat Uthman was speechless. Hazrat Bilal could not recite the call to prayer. Everyone's lungs were burning. This was an indescribable pain. At this moment, when the companions did not know what to do in these feelings, Hazrat Abu Bakr ascended the pulpit of the mosque and made the following speech. O oh people, Allah is one, there is no God but Him. Muhammad is His servant and messenger. If anyone worships Muhammad, let him know that he is dead. And as for those who serve Allah, verily, Allah is alive, everlasting and eternal. I remind you of Allah's saying, Muhammad is only a messenger, prophets have come and gone before him. Now if he dies or is killed, will you turn back? Whoever turns back cannot harm Allah. Allah will reward those who give thanks. Then he informed them of the death of the Prophet as Allah had foretold. O oh my messenger, surely you will die and they will die. And he continued, He who adheres to the book of Allah and the sunnah of the messenger of Allah will find the truth. He who divides between the two will go astray. Let not Zatan deceive you with the death of our Prophet. Let him not lead you astray from your religion. Do not give the devil a chance to reach you. These words come those present and gave comfort to everyone. Hazrat Abu Bakr's reminder of this verse was like a wake-up call for all the companions. Hazrat Abu Bakr thus performed a very important duty. The hypocrites wanted to create mischief by taking advantage of this turmoil. The issue of who the caliph would be and how he would be chosen could have caused many conflicts. The companions who thought that if the Islamic State remained headless for a long time, Islam and Muslims would suffer great harm 
agreed that the matter should be resolved as soon as possible and should not be delayed. In this respect, on the one hand, while the burial of the Messenger of Allah continued, on the other hand, some of the companions started to work to determine the Caliph. Hazrat Abu Bakr left the funeral arrangements to Hazrat Ali and went to the companions who were discussing the selection of the Caliph. As a result of this meeting, a consensus was reached that Hazrat Abu Bakr should be the Caliph. The next day, the companions gathered in the mosque and pledged their allegiance to Hazrat Abu Bakr. Thus, one of the important disputes was resolved and Hazrat Abu Bakr, the most virtuous of the people after the prophets, became the Caliph of the Prophet. The companions gave Hazrat Abu Bakr the title of Khalifatul Rasul Allah and unanimously accepted that he was the deputy of the Messenger of Allah in the implementation of the principles of Islam and the administration of the state. Hazrat Abu Bakr ascended the pulpit and made the following speech to the people. O oh people, if I fulfill my duty properly, help me. And if I am wrong, show me the right path. Truthfulness is safety, and falsehood is treason. The weak among you is strong with me, until he receives his due. And the strong among you is weak in my sight, until someone else's right is taken from him. If a nation shuns jihad in the way of Allah, that nation will fall into weakness. If evil multiplies in a nation, that nation will be afflicted with calamity. Obey me as I obey Allah and his messenger. If I disobey Allah and his messenger, you are not obliged to obey me. Let's pray. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all worthy of his mercy. Thus began the era of Hazrat Abu Bakr, the first caliph. Before his death, the Prophet peace be upon him had prepared some of the army under the command of Hazrat Usama to march to Muta. After the death of the Messenger of Allah peace be upon him, it was debated whether this expedition should be abandoned or not. Hazrat Abu Bakr stated that he would not detain this army and ordered the expedition. The army marched north parallel to the Red Sea for two and a half months. It took the rebellious tribes here back under its control. However, after a while, orders came from the Caliph to return. After the death of the Messenger of Allah, there were reports that some of the Arabs who had converted to Islam after his death and whose hearts had not warmed up to the religion sufficiently had apostatized. The army was recalled so that the Muslims would not be weak. There were apostates for reasons such as not wanting to pay zakah, claiming that some commands and prohibitions had ceased to be valid with the death of the Prophet and intertribal strife. There were also false prophets. These revolts spread throughout Arabia except Mecca, Medina and Taif. Abu Bakr radiallahu an sent a message to the tribes around Medina and ordered them to gather to fight the apostates. Gradually, the army of the Caliphate was being formed. In the meantime, Usama and his army had reached Medina and joined the army. The Islamic army first fought the apostate tribes of Abs and Zubian and defeated them. Upon this victory, many of the tribes in that region converted to Islam. The Islamic army then returned to Medina. The dispersed Abs and Zubian tribes took refuge with Tuleha, who claimed to be a prophet. Tuleha moved with his army from Sumeira and headed towards Buzaha, where he established his headquarters. After gathering his army in Medina, Hazrat Abu Bakr divided his army into 11 units to fight the apostates. He appointed a commander at the head of each army. 
One of these commanders, Khalid ibn al-Walid, was the head and leader of the commanders and was to go against the false prophet Tulayha in Buzaha. Ikrimah bin Abu Jahl was to go against the false prophet Musaylamat al-Kazab who had appeared in Yamama. Abu Umayyah was to go against the remnants of the false prophet Al-Aswad Ansi who had appeared in Yemen. Khalid bin Said was to go to Sham. Amr bin As was to go against the tribes of Quda, Wadiya and Harith. Hudayfa bin Muhsin was to go to Oman. Arfajah bin Harsama was to go to Mahra. Tarfa bin Hajib was to go against the Khawazins. Suwait bin Mukrin was to go to the area of Tihama and Ala bin Hadrami was to go to Bahrain. Shurahbil bin Hassana was to follow Ikrimah's army. Plans were prepared. All the commanders took their troops and started moving towards their areas. Hazrat Abu Bakr was constantly inviting the apostate tribes back to Islam and telling them that he would not be responsible for what would happen. The false prophet Tulayha was one of those who claimed prophethood after the death of our prophet. He told his followers that Gabriel had come to him and asked them to follow him. He told those who prayed that they did not need to prostrate because Allah did not need it. According to Ibn al-Asir, many Arabs believed this. The tribes of Asad, Gatafan, and Tai believed in him. His headquarters were in the Buzaha area. Khalid ibn al-Walid first marched to Aknaf, the center of the Tay tribe. Here, he met with the Tay tribe. The Tay tribe said that they were afraid that Tuleha would kill them, so they obeyed him and returned to Islam. After that, the tribes of Adi and Jadila also converted to Islam and supported Khalid bin Walid with soldiers. Thus, the number of soldiers under the command of Khalid bin Walid was 1,500. From here, the army of Tuleha was mobilized. Eventually, the two armies came face to face and Khalid bin Walid won a great victory. Tuleha fled to Syria. After Khalid bin Walid established control here, he marched on Malik bin Nuwayra in Buta. Malik had been sent to this region as a Zakar officer during the time of the Prophet. However, after the Prophet's death, he declared his allegiance to Sejar. Sejia was a woman who claimed prophethood. Malik bin Nuwayra was killed in a battle in this region and control was restored. Sejia, who claimed to be a prophetess, took refuge with Musaylama. Musaylama was one of the other false prophets. He claimed to have received revelation from an angel named Rahman. He had no difficulty in finding followers because he abolished the obligatory prayers and said that drinking and fornication were permitted. Abu Jahl's son Ikrima was sent to this region, but this army was not successful against Musaylama and withdrew. This was because Musaylama had a large army of 40,000 people at his command. Hazrat Ikrima, who had to retreat, was waiting for the arrival of Khalid bin Walid. Finally, when Hazrat Khalid came with his army, the two armies united and faced the army of Musaylama in Yamama. At first, it seemed as if the Musaylam army was victorious. At one point, they even managed to enter the tents of the Muslims. But then, the situation changed. The companions showed unprecedented patience and endurance in battle that day. Finally, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted them victory. The apostates turned their backs and began to flee. The Muslims began to pursue them. They were killing those they caught and bringing their swords down on their necks. Then, Musaylam and his army retreated to their castle. The walls of the castle were high, so no one could enter. The Muslims could only lay siege to it. Then Bera bin Malik radiallahu an, one of the companions, 
proposed something unthinkable. He said, wrap me up in a cloth and throw me into the garden. The Muslims, who were surprised at first, did as he said as night fell. They wrapped him in a cloth and threw him into the garden. Hazrat Bera had just fallen behind the gate of the city wall. He immediately stood up, neutralized the guards at the gate and opened the gates. Thus, the Muslims waiting in ambush quickly entered the castle gate. The apostates, who realized the raid, were terrified. A terrifying battle broke out inside the castle. In this turmoil, the false prophet Musaylama was standing near a breach in the wall, trying to climb it to escape. He seemed to have lost his mind. He was foaming at the mouth. At that moment, Hazrat Wahshi, who had murdered Hazrat Hamza in the Battle of Uhud and had later converted to Islam, reached him. He swung his spear at Musaylama. The spear entered from one side of Musaylama and came out from the other side. The spear that had murdered Hazrat Hamza years before had now sent the false prophet to hell. Thus, the battle came to an end and the Islamic army was victorious over the apostates. 20,000 of Musaylam's followers were killed by the Muslims, while the Islamic army lost 2,000 murders. Good news was reaching Hazrat Abu Bakr from the lands of Islam. First the rebellions in Yemen, then the Hadramaut region, Mehra, Oman, Bahrain, and eventually all the conquered areas were under control again. Peace once again prevailed in the lands of Islam. These wars, which went down in history, as the Rida Wars resulted in decisive victories for the Muslims. Thus, the internal dangers were eliminated. Now, it was time for conquest. That's the end of another video. More videos about historic battles will be published soon. So please consider subscribing and pressing the bell button to be informed about them. By liking, commenting and sharing the video, you can support us a lot. Thanks to everyone who watched the video until the end and supported us. We are Historic Battles and look forward to seeing you in the next one.